How's it going Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. Today I have another excerpt from the Chase the Craft podcast with Matt Drew and today we're talking all about how you can actually malt grain at home by yourself. Pretty freaking cool. If you want to catch the whole podcast you can do so at chasethecraft.com. Let's get stuck in. Assuming that people can get their hands on something to malt, <laughs> have a stab at it. I think from here on in, let's talk super generic because let's face it, at this at this point in time, if someone's got to this point in time, we've got no idea what they've got their hands on. We can talk specifics in terms of equipment, but not so much the analysis of the actual seed they've got because God knows what they got their hands on. I think the next thing is equipment, right? Like what do people actually need at home to be able to do what? Like a five, 10 pounds or maybe 20 pounds batch of malt somewhere between you know two and 10 kilos i guess yeah so if you want to break it down to its most fundamental basic level uh you need a bucket maybe do two buckets put that inside the other bucket and then that's that's basically your steep vessel and so when you're done steeping all you have to do is lift that one bucket out and it's going to drain when you're ready to go back again and go back into steeps you can just i mean obviously empty that water out because here's the thing um a couple of things are going to happen when you go into steep you're cleaning the grain you're getting all of the excess like all the shit that doesn't need to be there you're getting rid of all of that so that's all going to be left behind in that water so you want to start off with clean water every time you're going to want like maybe, you know, the, the thing I keep thinking about is like a screen on a window. That's excellent because there's plenty of room for airflow and uh, carbon dioxide. Once your grain starts waking up, it's going to start uh, throwing off carbon dioxide and you want to get rid of that carbon dioxide because that brain. Right. So you need the airflow. Yep. You're, you, in a perfect world, uh, you would be able to put that grain into a humid environment uh, in order to not let it dry out so much, but still give it enough air uh, so that right. it can breathe and you don't have to worry about it going acidic. You're basically creating a false bottom, right? You you want a, you want a big ass colander that's going to hold the grain, but let water through. I would imagine something like a grain father or a robo brew or any of the stainless steel brew in a bag type setups would work great for that, right? You fill the, yeah, yeah fill the 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 metal mesh up or even a brew in a bag bag right just something to hold grain and this is a good point if 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 you're doing this at home if you're brewing or distilling at home anyway i mean the odds are you already have the equipment that you need to malt you just need to repurpose it you know the bottom line is you need something to soak the grain in you need something to let it dry in that's got good airflow uh, but doesn't make the grain go everywhere uh and you need something to lay it out on in order to to control the germination process. And that's that's really it. And yeah. and uh, you're going to want to control the process to the greatest extent that you can, understanding that if you're doing it at home, it's a completely <laughs> yeah. story, you, know? you can try, but you're not really. <laughs> From personal experience as well, I can tell you, you're going to fuck up a lot of batches. And I've seen this myself as well, uh, because I've had I've had four ton batches of malt uh, get a little bit, uh, on the acidic side Uh-oh. That, that, makes, <laughs> that there, there is definitely a place for that. It's yeah. even, if, and that's the cool thing about malt. Even if you fuck it up, doesn't mean you can't use it. Yeah. You call and, it something different. <laughs> well, and, and in some cases it's really cool. Like, yeah. like, uh, like lactic, like a, a really lactic fermentation, man, that makes for some awesome, uh, malt whiskey. All right, man. So we've got a vessel, we've got our grain, we're going to get it wet. And obviously there's a thousand different things that you as a professional monster would be looking at to decide when to stop getting it wet. <laughs> but would you suggest to sort of put it into a couple of sentences for people that, that don't have all that background, would you suggest a, a period of time to soak it for or something specific to look for to decide when to pull it from that first soak? So the best, the best method that you have in order to do this is to weigh a hunt count out 100 dry kernels of barley before you steep them and, okay. and weigh them yep and get an average weight yep 
here's the thing. If you're getting a feed barley, just assume that you're going to have really high protein content. So you're going to need to be in steeps and ARS for a longer period of time. So I would put my first steep in anywhere between 10 and 12 hours, which is okay. which I know a long time. And then go into air rest eight to 10 hours. I mean, a really long first air rest is going to really make that grain thirsty for when you go into your second steep. Put it in for 10 to 12 hours in the water. Yep. And then we jack it up and let it drain for 10 to 12 hours. Yeah. And, and still, but still do it in a way where you can, uh, you can give it plenty of oxygen. As, so if you can move it around or like a bag would be good for that, right? You can sort of gently exactly. manipulate it around again. Yeah. Yep. The main thing is though, is you got to remember, even when you come out of your first steep, you're, you're going to be generating carbon dioxide. So, yeah. and that carbon dioxide, obviously, since it's heavier than air, it's going to want to fall down. So the stuff that's at the bottom of that grain bed is going to have the hardest time in respiration. So you want to try right. to control that process as much as you can so that all that grain has the same access to oxygen throughout, throughout the process. So, and okay. whatever, whatever system you've got, that's going to mean something different, but basically that's what you need to do. So when you come out of steep, that first steep, you're going to want to figure out, okay, what's my moisture content now? So you're going to mm -hmm. count out another hundred kernels, make sure you dry them off so that you're not just, cause you want to, you, you want to measure bound moisture, not free moisture. So you want to dry yeah, out. You don't want it to be wet on the outside. Yeah. And, yeah. and a good, a good kitchen, like a, a high, higher precision kitchen scale uh, yep. is going to give you the best results, but you want to weigh those hundred kernels out and then compare them the, the weight of the wet kernels to the weight of the dry kernels. Cause that's going to tell you one-to-one, -one, okay, here's how much higher moisture content is in there. And, and what number are you looking for there? So you're going to coming out of the first steep, you're going to want to be at about 25% moisture content. Let's make the math easy and pick a number that makes absolutely no sense. What you're saying is if your weight of those kernels was hundred grams, to start with, you now want 125. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and from that point on, uh, coming out of that first steep, when you do that, that's going to give you the clearest indication of the path forward from that point. Uh, okay. So and, if, if that number was low when you first pulled it out, would you just say screw it and go in again? No. No, because... Oh, no. Okay. So once, no, you've, once you've pulled it out of the water, you just keep it out of the water. Keep it out of the water for a little while. Let it yeah. dry out a little bit. Because the other thing too is there's 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 no risk in taking it out too soon, but well, there's less risk taking it out too soon than there is in keeping it in too long. Okay, because you can drown the grain and kill it. Okay, um, but if you take it out too soon, it's no big deal because it was dry to begin with. And we've got another steep coming up. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the other thing too. When you're going through the steep ARS and germination process, you're looking for a specific odor and that is cucumber. Okay. And once you get a strong oh. cucumber odor, yeah. uh, that means first, that means two things. First of all, uh, respiration is happening because what you're smelling is the carbon dioxide that the mm -hmm. grain is giving off. And that means that it's, it's happy. You don't want sourness. So if you're smelling right. that clean cucumber, it means that the grain is healthy, that you don't have any uh, lactic, that's that's starting to get out of control and you don't have any other variables because once you start smelling that stuff um it can get into a really bad place really quick yeah <laughs> and, uh, as long as you're smelling that cucumber you are in good shape just keep doing what you're doing and don't mess with it because it, the grain's doing what you want it to do uh it's like a it always reminds me of uh, alfalfa sprouts yeah like opening a bag of bag of alfalfa sprouts and sticking your nose in it yep. all right so we've we've now dried it out i'm assuming we're putting it back into the bucket again now getting yep. it wet again Yep. yep. And then uh, depending, I mean, here's the thing is you have to look, you have to look at uh, where you came out of your first steep at, mm -hmm. and then you have to basically use that as a, as a judgment call in, in terms of how long your next steep needs to be. Here's the most critical thing though. You're going to want to take samples periodically and measure them in order to understand how your, your grain hydration is going. And that's going to give you the rate of hydration. And once you have it in for a couple of hours, take a sample, weigh it, figure out how much higher moisture content percentage you've got. And then you are intuitively going to have a better understanding of how long that next steep is going to take. And so what's the goal for the next steep? Like, let's say we, we just took a, another reading and now we're at 30% hydration. What are mm -hmm. we, what are we aiming for here? You want to get through 33% at least. Okay. For the second steep. For the second steep. Now in a perfect world, your grain isn't going to need a third steep and 
and you're going to want to be at between 42 and 44 percent because at that point uh, you're also going to start taking grain samples and look at chit you're going to want to get a chit count and once okay. once you get to about 92 to 95 percent chitting which means that germination has started your grain is telling you i'm ready to germinate send me to germination okay. remind people what the chit is so the chit is the beginning of the rootlets that are going to develop. Um, and then also, and it, the, the chit happens on the basal end of the grain of the barley kernel. Uh, and so that's where, that's where all the, 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 the magic happens. That's, that's, that's the embryo out of the embryo grows the rootlets, um, out of the, out of the bottom of the, of the barley, barley kernel, the rootlets, which obviously become the roots of the plant. And then yeah. <laughs> Up the up the back side on the dorsal side of that grain is going to be the acrospire, and and figure if this is the base of the grain, um, and that acrospire, you know, it's going to start really slow and small, but it's going to start doing this. If you're making a malt for an all malt distillate, you're going to want that acrospire to be about here when you send it into kilman. But that all starts with the chit. So once once you are at about 92 to 95 percent chitting, uh, yep. you're ready to go into germination, and that's basically just controlling the variables and giving a a a consistent and more stable environment. The grain doesn't care. The grain's ready to go now. That's more for you. You want to be able to control that process and you're going to want to keep it low temperature and slow germination because that's going to give you the most modification. That's going to give you the most potential spirit yield in the mash, mm -hmm. but it's also going to give you the best ratio of enzyme package and extract. We've gone through a second steep and we're measuring the hydration rate while it's steeping. We're not going to steep it for more than 10 hours again because we don't want to drown it or what's the point for the second one where you want to like stop and go, okay, I need to do a third. It's a gut call. Honestly, okay. you just got to get the feel for it. Uh, and, and there is no hard and fast rule. I mean, you basically, you, the hard and fast rule is you want your grain to be happy, yeah. but what that grain needs to be happy is going to vary from grain to grain to grain to grain. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're telling us is it's complicated and you can't give me a short answer. You just you, you, you have to practice it and you have to understand what the grain is telling you because the grain will tell you exactly what it needs you to do. You just have to, under, you just have to learn how to listen to it and how to interpret yeah. what it's telling you into an action plan. So let's say we've got to greater than 33%, ideally more towards the 40 45%, 42%, I think you said, wasn't it? Moisture content. And we are getting that 90 plus percent chit rate. So now what do we do? Think about it in terms of floor malting. It's a thin layer of barley spread out on the floor. The Scots figured it out <laughs> centuries ago, which is why <laughs> is that you want to be able to control that bed evenly and, and precisely throughout the entire grain bed. And how you do that is a long, flat, thin bed of grain. Now, if you think about floor malting, what do they do? They go in and they turn it by hand every so often. The reason why they do that is there's three reasons. The first one is they drive off heat um, because that heat is going to make germination happen faster. And the faster that happens, the less modification you're going to have. The second thing is they drive off carbon dioxide and they give plenty of opportunity for the grain to breathe. And then the third thing is as germination continues, those, ro those rootlets coming out the bottom of the grain, they get longer and longer. And as you get more rootlets, they want to tangle together. Right, right, right. And so uh, turning the malt is going to keep those rootlets nice and free and loose because once those bind up, all the grain yeah. that's stuck in that, in that clump isn't going to breathe, and that's going to be a potential hazard for the thing going going rotten. Practical terms for people doing a smallish, you know, like we said, somewhere between two and ten kilos. I have to imagine you could just use like baking trays or Tupperware or something. The most important thing is is that first of all, you can control the environment. And what what factors are you talking about controlling? I have to imagine we're talking temperature. Maybe Temperature, mainly temperature, but also humidity, if you can control okay. humidity as well. Um, and that's why like wintertime, no matter where you are, wintertime is a great time to malt because it's really easy to find a place where you can keep it nice and cool. And you can also yeah. humidify the air. I mean, just go get humidifiers and, and put them in the room where you're making your malt. Yeah. And, you and it's always, it. always easier to warm something up than it is to, to cool it down, yeah. whatever you're doing. <laughs> By that point, it's already out of control and you got to figure out yeah. <laughs> 
if you can go down to to the hardware store and just buy a window screen, that's oh what, yeah, okay. That's because you, so you want airflow from the bottom too, do you? Yeah, because you want to give that carbon dioxide an escape route. We lay it out. And it's going to start drying off. I'm assuming instantly because it's no longer in water. Just get a spray bottle and and just spray it down. Make sure that there's plenty of moisture on there because that's the other thing too. Once that grain gets down below 33%, that's where you start getting into germination stopping. But you don't want to stop the process unless you're the person controlling it and you're telling the grain when you want it to stop, which is going to happen in kilning. Obviously, practically with the volumes we're doing, turning's not an issue. You can just do, <laughs> do it manually as opposed yeah. to when you're talking four... <laughs> thousand kilos or something is a bit different um how often do they want to turn it uh you're going to want to turn it probably uh at least every eight hours um and can you turn it too much is turning it too much a problem no you can't turn okay. it too much especially on a smaller scale because and that's part of the part of one of the one of the uh, the big benefits to hand turning the malt is that it's easier on the grain you know, there are okay. pneumatic systems and all-in-one systems that have augers and helices in them that turn the malt. And that's all a lot rougher on the, on the malt than just turning yeah. it by hand because you can control how gentle that is. So just literally use your hands or a spatula or whatever. And yep. I'm imagining the, the biggest thing there is just making sure that you get literally turnover, right? So the, the stuff that's on the bottom is, is being moved to the top. You're not just disrupting it. You actually need to rotate it. Yeah. And again, it depends. It depends on whether or not you're concerned about the stuff on the bottom having access to oxygen. If you are concerned okay. about that. Yeah. Here's the thing. There's no downside to it in terms of best practices. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can't go wrong just turning the bed over, um, especially okay. on a smaller scale. It's not it's not difficult to do. How long is, does this process go for? And, and what are we looking for to say that it's cooked? So germination, you'll be three to four days. Uh, you are looking for, when you look at the, um, let's do this thing again. When you're looking at the, uh, there we go, the acrospire, you can see over here on, on this end, that's fully modified because that little white thing, it's a malt wiener. But anyways, that acrospire, the, the, the stem that's coming up the side, when that is between three quarters, uh, the length of the full barley kernel to one or the full length of barley, barley kernel, that's where you're fully modified. Assuming that you've been controlling the process really well and, and that you're getting really well modified malt that started with a, uh, a very well hydrated kernel. So taking right. all of those okay. things um, into account, once your acrospire gets to between three quarters and the full length of the barley kernel, at least 85, 90% of the samples that you take. Here's the other thing. Malting is all about taking samples. You can't guess. You have to constantly keep your eye on that grain and see what it's doing in order to understand uh, what you need to do as the maltster. So once you, you've got enough of those acrospires that are at the right length, uh, then you're going to want to... Uh, Base, you're, you're going to want to stop the process. You're going to want to dry it out. Now, in terms of a home malting, if you're doing it at home, the best thing that you can do is start drying that grain out in germination. Oh, okay. Because it's going to, even if it drops below, once you get, once you get more modified, um, even if you drop below a particular moisture content and the grain starts to dry out, germination is going to continue. But it's at the end stage anyway, so it's not as important. The more critical time is the very beginning of germination. Once you get into the middle, you're kind of in the nuts and bolts. You're in the guts of it. Um, that's easy. That's fairly easy to control, assuming that you've got a, uh, an environment where you can control it. But once you get to about majority of your kernels between one half and three quarters, you're going to want to start drying that grain out in order to make kilning shorter. And that's just literally stop spraying it, keep turning it. Yep, if you're you controlling it. humidity, start dropping the humidity a little bit. Yep, exactly, exactly. Thanks a bunch to Matt. That is an insane amount of information, which I'm actually hoping to put into practice personally. I think even with this crazy shutdown, I've managed to get my hands on 10 kilos of raw barley. I'm hoping I can make that happen soon. Anyway, guys, if you want to catch the full podcast, check it out at chasethecraft.com or on any of the major podcatchers. 